Good morning, good afternoon, good evening all to you all, uh, wherever you're tuning in from. My name is Michael Barrett, and I'm Head of Events and Corporate Social Responsibility here at TR Business. And I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Charlotte Turner, Editorial Director at TR Business, who will be co-moderating this session with me this morning. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And of course, thanks to our uh, wonderful panel of speakers who have taken the time and effort to, to be with us and prepare for this session here this morning. And we'll be introducing them in just a, a couple of minutes. Uh, but first of all, of course, a special thanks to all our sponsors, in particular Mars, our headline sponsor, and the sponsors of this particular webinar, Mars Beam Suntory, Diageo, JTI, and L'Occitane en Provence. But of course, thanks to all the sponsors supporting this event, whose uh, company logos you should be able to see on screen in, right now, um, because without their support, of course, this event would not be possible. As you know, you, there's no cost to get to registering for this event. We make it free of charge because we want to spread the message about sustainability and all the great things that are happening in our industry and could be happening in our industry as far and wide as possible. And we've heard some really good stuff already this week and some great ideas, new ideas, new concepts. And we'll hear some more right now in this session and throughout the rest of this week. Um, so that's the purpose of this event. We launched it last year uh, in the middle of the pandemic as an online event only, um, the inaugural one in 2021. It's the only event dedicated solely to sustainability. Um, as I said, it's online, but increasingly, well, obviously we had the sustainability session at the Travel Retail Consumer Forum in London last year, and we're curating more and more events um, with the, the trade associations who are inviting us to take part in their events on both consumer and sustainability, which are the two areas we've been focusing on here at TR Business. So the idea and the objectives behind this uh, whole event and this, these sessions is really to share ideas, new ideas, from within the industry, but also from companies that are perhaps not too familiar, you're not too familiar with from outside, as we'll see in this session. So we want this session for you to be a springboard for creativity and collaboration. Use this opportunity to connect with our speakers and, and see how you can work with them, whether you know the company already or you're just discovering them uh, this week in these sessions. Um, last year, we had David Katz, founder and CEO of the Plastic Bank as our keynote speaker. Um, and Again, after that session, he was contacted by a good number of companies wanting to work with them. And the same is happening this year as well with a, a number of fresh faces we're bringing in from outside the industry and you'll meet now in this session coming up too. We've also broadened the scope of topics that we're covering this year. Um, as you have seen yesterday, we had two sessions that are new to the agenda uh, on both health and well-being and diversity and inclusion of some very animated sessions that took place yesterday. Um, and we've got a great speaker lineup all through the week. We had the keynote session and the design session on Tuesday. I mentioned yesterday's sessions already. We've got now coming up uh, right now, circular solutions, innovations and inspiration, We're talking about recycling, upcycling, design and all different aspects that you'll hear about. Later on today, we've got a session on the future of food. And tomorrow we've got a, a session dedicated the wines and spirits category. Uh, and our, of course, our closing uh, key keynote sessions in two parts, the um, green um, uh, influences combining people planet and purpose. Of course, I can't forget our sustainability pitch sessions. We had one yesterday, and we've got one coming up this afternoon. Uh, yesterday, we had Altavia, Gonzalez, Baez, Mondelez, and Nestle vying for the, uh, the Trailblazer and Hero, Travel Retail Sustainability Trailblazer and Hero statuses. So congratulations to Gonzalez, Baez, and Nestle for uh, achieving the, uh, trail, uh, the sorry, Travel Retail Sustainability Hero status. And of course, to Altavia and Mondelez for the uh, achieving the trail, the travel retail sustainability trailblazer status. And today we'll hear from L'Oreal, Mondelez once again with a different pitch, Moroccan oil, and New Wave. Um, so that's at 2 p.m. this afternoon, British summertime. All the times on the program are BST, of course, British summertime. So please do participate actively in this session. You've got the Q&A panel there on the right-hand side of the, um, the video screen. Below the video screen, you've got the speaker name. So if you're just wondering who's actually the name of that person who's speaking right now, if you don't know them, you can check the names down there. Uh, in the Q&A panel, I've just posted uh, uh, the link to the program, if you haven't got that already, so you can see the full program uh, for this week's lineup there um, with all the photos and bios of our speakers and sponsors. Um, and as you probably know, this session, as all the others, are available on video on demand 
by just clicking at the same place you, you did to access this session. You can go back in the previous sessions and click on to, to review and replay the sessions if you missed them or share them with your colleagues. They're also actually on our YouTube panel uh, channel, sorry, um, already. So the sessions that have already taken place, if you go on YouTube uh, slash TR Business or whatever that you Google TR Business on YouTube, check out the 2022 Travel Retail Sustainability Week um, playlist and you'll see the sessions already available there. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Charlotte, who will introduce our speakers. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, if any of the uh, the things that Michael mentioned aren't clear or, or perhaps you'd like to hear them again and thought that sounded really interesting, then please don't he hesitate to contact uh, Michael at trbusiness.com or indeed myself, Charlotte at trbusiness.com. I appreciate there's an awful lot of information in there and there's because we have an enormous amount of exciting uh, events coming up as well throughout the year. So thank you, Michael, for that introduction. Uh, yes, I'm Charlotte Turner, Editorial Director at TR Business, and I've been personally so inspired and delighted uh, to hear from every one of our speakers so far this week. It really has been a real eye-opening uh, event this year and I'm really excited to be a part of it. Um, I'm also really pleased to see how many of you are interacting with the Q&A. We've had some really stimulating debates thanks to the audience putting questions in, so thank you for those. And also, again, I'll encourage the panellists today to uh, you know, talk to each other on the panel, uh, just challenge each other and indeed you know, press for more information for themselves uh, and their company's developments. And uh, again, at the end of this session, like we've Done with the others we'll come to you all right at the end and ask for your next steps and see uh, what what sort of uh, actions you might be able to take from you know listening to your peers and also perhaps getting a question in from the audience so looking forward to hearing those at the end of the session uh, right now I'd like to uh, pass over to you all so you can introduce yourselves to our audience uh, this morning or this afternoon this evening uh, wherever you are in the world so I'd like to start uh, with Chris uh, today please Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody here from Singapore. My name is Chris Morris. I am the director and partner of uh, Concourse. We're a sustainable design and project management company uh, working in the travel retail industry all over the world. Um, and as I say, I'm based, based here in Singapore. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and over to Stephanie. Yes, thank you, Charlotte, uh, for inviting me to this second session on uh, sustainability. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, all of you. So I am Stephanie Page Terrier, Head of Concept, Design and Construction at Lagardère Travel Retail for the Duty Free and the Fashion Branch. So my team and myself, we are based in Paris, and together we manage uh, the concept development, the design and the construction of stores, ranging from pop-up formats up to flagship stores across mainly EMEA. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, now over to Graham. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, my name's Graham Stewart. I'm the CEO of EnviroPoint and the retail director for Luggage Point. Um, with EnviroPoint, we work with sustainable plastic solutions such as polymateria to essentially try and build into the circular economy different offshoots to make sure that when products aren't recycled, they at least biodegrade in the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. And finally, Naomi. Hi, uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Naomi McKenzie, and I am one of the co-founders and the co-CEO of Kytro. We're a Swiss-based company that focuses on measuring and monitoring food waste in commercial kitchens for the likes of canteens, restaurants, or hotels. And we use AI to automate the process of food waste measurement and then reduction. Really fascinated uh, a concept there, and I'm really excited to have that discussion with you later to enlighten the audience uh, about about the concept they probably haven't had a chance to to see yet. So really excited about that. Um, Stephanie, I wanted to come over to you first. Uh, we we've heard from your colleagues uh, so far this week, uh, and you know Lagarde has uh, indeed also put out um, a very important announcement about uh, carbon neutrality by 2023. Uh, it's a very ambitious target, um, but uh, I think uh, some of the comments that we've had on social media have 
said, you know, oh, very ambitious, but, you know, how else should we be approaching this topic? It's an emergency, as some of our previous panelists and speakers have said. Um, and, I, and in your position as a concept design and uh, construction, we might not normally hear fr from yourself, um, but because sustainability has kind of really been a, become a priority for every travel retail stakeholder, uh, I guess now you're, you're more, uh, you're being asked to speak about what Lagardère does in this respect more and more. Can you give us a little bit more uh, information about perhaps and provide some recent examples uh, of how you're really trying to improve the sustainability of the design and construction? Yes, Charlotte, uh, actually, you can share some uh, slides. Is it okay? Can you see my screen? We can see the screen. It's not in presenter mode, but uh, that, that shouldn't be too much. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So yeah, I can share with the audience today an example in Geneva Airport, which is illustrating how at Lagarde Travel Retail, we turn our CSR commitments in concrete actions. But, because by the way, a similar project is about to start in Singapore for a souvenir store with our local team and concourse, Chris, uh, Chris Morris, uh, who is with us today. So as a preamble, let's consider the three key points that drove our project in Geneva Airport. The first one is about sustainability. Sustainability matters to all, no question about that. But this said, once your CSR strategy is set, you need concrete actions, you need case studies. Because the second point, which is really key, is about engaging the teams. And to do that with my team, my concept design and construction team, I chose really about the curiosity angle. We engaged all together on a discovery journey of sustainability, about what is sustainability concretely in our, in our daily work. And to do that, we did a test and learn project in Geneva Airport, small steps and big learnings. And last but not least, you probably all know about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The number 17 is about partnerships for the goal, and this one matters. Our project in Geneva Airport is a good illustration of how partnerships can boost a project. So, as I said, <clears throat> sorry, sustainability matters. Melanie Guildou, you mentioned her earlier, is our CSR Executive Vice President at Lagarde Travel Retail, and she was another speaker during the Sustainability Week, so I will not detail our group CSR strategy there. However, as you can see on the screen, we have set <clears throat> 12 tangible commitments under the four pillars of our CSR strategy. And on the left pillar, planet, our first commitment is about decreasing our carbon emissions to contribute to ambitious industry targets. So without further ado, let's investigate what we did in Geneva. So Geneva, in a nutshell, a few years ago, the airport started the construction of a high energy performance airport extension called the East Wing. When at Lagarde, we heard about this pioneering approach to build an airport terminal with a state-of-the-art sustainable infrastructure, it seemed really obvious to us to play our part with a special duty-free store, our very first eco-friendly idea duty-free store. So in a nutshell, this is a project on one hand which is decarbonized. We took our existing idea duty-free uh, concept and we tried to decarbonize it. And on the other hand, this is also about an offer. So it's a classic duty-free offer. And it includes for the first time in our network, a strong highlight on the selection of sustainable offer. So the subject of this session is being is really more centered on design and construction. So I will develop what we did for the store itself because we chose to act on the carbon footprint, as I previously said. So how did we proceed? We partnered, I mentioned the importance of partnerships earlier. So we partnered with a French shop fitting company, Media6, you can see their logo on the right. They developed their own carbon calculator, which we called Ecologic. They calculated what the footprint of our project shop fittings would have been before eco-design, and they proposed us many ways to reduce our footprint. I give you a few examples huh, just to, uh, to illustrate how you can decrease the carbon footprint of your furniture. For example, you can limit the use of glue, reduce the number of materials, decrease the waste of the furniture, 
decide to revamp existing furniture, etc. Then, together with Media6, our partner uh, shop fitting company, we agreed on an achievable, thus ambitious, carbon footprint reduction target of minus 40% on our existing concept, because the idea there was not to create a new concept from scratch, but really to decarbonize the existing one, as you, as you can see on the screen. So in a nutshell, what were our key takeaways from this Geneva case study? So first, partnerships are key. Our suppliers for this project, as well as our landlord, were very supportive. And we will come back to that with a video just after. Expertise. I really advise everyone listening at the moment to really hire the right experts on board, of, on board of your project as early as possible. They will help you to focus on what really matters because it's very easy to get lost uh, when you start with CSR uh, and especially uh, when you start with uh, trying to decrease your carbon footprint. So for us, we decided to, uh, to, uh, to uh, onboard an expert who was an environmental MEP engineering office. We chose one target. It's very important to have one target because as I just said, it's very easy to get lost. So our target was really focusing on the carbon footprint reduction. We defined the target, it's very important, the minus 40%, and we monitored it thanks to KPIs. And finally, but this is quite obvious, Try to work with humility, fail and try again, and do not hesitate to revise your goal. And then I also wanted to share with you this morning three ideas to move forward towards a more sustainable industry. The first one is about the green energy. In most airports throughout the world, we travel operator, we do not buy directly the energy that we use. Most of the time, the energy is provided to us by the airport. However, if you consider the average carbon footprint of a store life, the energy used matters a lot. The electric consumption will approximately weight about 70% of the total carbon footprint of a store, again, if you consider the overall uh, life of the store. The over 30% will be about raw materials used for its construction, waste management, and water consumption. These numbers are orders of magnitude, huh? of course, but significant enough to lead you to open discussions with, uh, with uh, your landlords, with our landlords, and to ask them about the source of the energy that they provide to us, to our stores. Then the second point is about less is more. Seems obvious, but another lead, uh, which we are investigating right now with my team, and which I uh, really encourage you to discuss with your landlords is about the power delivered to the stores which we have to build in new terminals, especially. It is easy, but it is really easier to reduce the carbon footprint of the stores if you act all together on the electric consumption, because you as an operator, you can do something, but nobody Will no, no operator will stand for a cave looking store, even if it is to decrease its electric consumption, as if your landlord is imposing guidelines, uh, for example, uh, um, uh, indicating uh, um, uh, certain uh, power for the lighting, uh, certain lighting power per square meter, which has to be respected by all the operators. Definitely, it will be a good way to move forward. And last but not least, it's about the era of uh, circularity. The questions which we are also uh, raising at the moment in my team is how can we, how can we integrate circularity? How can we make it become a real new basic? But for example, and I will uh, finish on that, at tender stage, when we bid on an existing activity, we have to ask ourselves about what could be reused, what could be revamped, and eventually what should be replaced and recycled. The designers, the architects, and the engineers are there really to help us making this approach a strength without compromising on the commercial appealing, the differentiation, of course, and the success of the project. But maybe we can uh, now launch, just to, uh, to make a conclusion on, the, on this little project in Geneva, maybe we can uh, launch uh, the small video. Uh, this is André Schneider, 
as a um, CEO of uh, Geneva Airport, who is uh, speaking about our project. Geneva Airport has been engaged for many years in sustainable development. It is highly important for us not only to develop the connectivity of this region, which is one of its points of attraction and also for the international Geneva, but also to make sure that this development is done in a respectuous way for our neighbors and also the environment. In this respect, we have engaged us to be uh, exempt of CO2 emissions by 2033 to 2040 and also reduce our noise on our neighbours to a level of 20 years ago by 2030. In this context, we can only be proud and happy and applaud the initiative of Lagardère uh, Travel Retail to actually create in our new East Wing terminal, which is our new terminal for intercontinental flights, which is a very important component of our traffic, to actually make it in an eco-friendly way. To somewhere build this shop and offer products in there which are fully respectful of the environment, but also respect what is another value of Geneva Airport, the proximity. That means we are also putting forward products of this region. So we clearly see that there is an excellent alignment between the objectives of Geneva Airport to be a green airport, to be as green as possible and show the way to the industry how this can be done, replicated by this uh, duty-free shop opening at the end of this year in the East Wing where we will not only, it will not only be built in an um, environment-friendly way but it will offer eco-friendly products which are certified and which are really showing the next generation of products you want to buy in a way that protects the environment. Well, thank you uh, for explaining uh, uh, those concepts to us, and it's, it's, it's great to hear from um, uh, the CEO there as well. Um, I was just going to ask, there was many um, interesting things you brought up there, and one of them was obviously collaboration um, with landlords and how important that was in, in Geneva. And I was just wondering, you know, is it even possible or, or meaningful without that partnership with the landlord in order to reduce as a whole. I know there's many things you can do um, just as a retailer, but without the partnership, um, it, it doesn't seem to be as meaningful. Is, is, is that correct? Yes, it is fully correct, uh, Charlotte. I mean, it's, um, it's but, uh, but I mentioned partnership also because of um, the partnerships which we, which we had with uh, Media6, but uh, definitely if you do not get the support of your landlord, it's, uh, I mean, it's, uh, you can do things, but, uh, it will uh, it will uh, remain like uh, in a corner huh, of the room. So, and the thing is that, um, well, it was it was the very first time. And when, when we met, uh, we, we enfin, our landlord uh, and uh, Andre Schneider and his team in Geneva, and that we shared what uh, we we had the intention to do. They were so um, enthusiastic about the fact that it was science based. This is quite important. Huh? Uh, so, and this is uh, why I'm also uh, very proud to share this video. It's because, I mean, they were touched by the fact that we had a, a really science-based approach and that it was not just, you know, words saying we are going to make another, you know, uh, eco-design store, etc., etc. They were really seduced by, uh, by, the, by the way that we presented it and that we focused really on the carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you talked about partnership there, and of course, it wasn't just uh, the airport that was uh, was a partner. You had many uh, people, different uh, components coming together, and one of those components, uh, the, one of those companies you have worked with previously is is Concourse. Uh, um, and uh, Chris, I'd like to get uh, some of your uh, insights on this. I mean, uh, since the pandemic and in, in, over the last couple of years, have you seen um, an acceleration uh, in in trends and people coming to you perhaps uh, to ask for more sustainable ways of building and promoting things yeah good question thanks <clears throat> thank you charlotte and uh good morning and afternoon to everyone again um yeah absolutely i mean um even pre-covid uh concourse we were um you know doing a lot of work uh on the topic of sustainability and, and circularity um and what we found is over over this period it's been a great sort of reset 
uh, people have had time to really sort of take a look at uh, what matters to them, you know, in life generally, um, but also from a business standpoint, uh, looking at the important things and obviously uh, things like planet and people and, and humanitarian uh, topics really come to the surface. And, you know, we're really inundated in uh, conversations at the moment. Um, and it's, it's really, really good to see. Um, in fact, I want to share some slides as well, if this is my opportunity to, to do so. Yeah, please do. All righty, can you see that okay? You can see that, yeah, yeah, looks great. Great, great. So, yeah, so so thanks again. Um, so yeah, from a concourse perspective, uh, there's there's definitely nothing more than we love, uh, well, nothing more than we love than to uh, design fully circular and, and sustainable spaces. Um, it's something that we've been doing now uh, for about seven years. Um, the example that you see here, I know there's a, a banner cut out, is, is we're especially proud of. Um, it's a space we launched, was actually opened by the uh, Deputy um, Prime Minister here in Singapore last year. Um, and is one of the most sort of circular spaces in the country at the moment. Um, all of the uh, decorative ceiling panels that you see there uh, are made from recycled waste. Uh, all the paint that was used um, is sustainable paint made, made, from, uh, made from grape skin. Um, we have uh, reused, if you see the grey sort of vinyl tiles for the flooring, they were reused from another project. Um, we built our own secondhand marketplace and uh, so via that we, um, we collected a lot of tables and chairs that we could use, um, the tiles repurposed. So you know, just about everything in there is, is um, extremely circular and um, it's something that we've become very uh, excited to do for our customers. Um, but we did start our journey back in 2015 and, and we've talked a lot about transitioning to today. Um, you know, you need to, to move from a linear model where we take, make and throw to a, to a circular model. Um, and I think when you start to do the numbers and we've done some numbers and, and you realize that when you're a, you know, a, a brand or a retailer and travel retail and you look at the entire um, uh, sort of, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, um, the actual store construction and end of life, 65% um, uh, of your greenhouse gas emissions come from that process. So, so the topic of uh, sustainable design and fit out is, is a very, very important one when we talk about uh, circularity. Um, and it's really because of that, that we set up a uh, social enterprise in 2019. We launched it at TFWA called uh, Restore. And the problem that we, we came across, um, and actually it was with Lagerdeer, um, and our first uh, upcycled uh, project was with uh, Monica in Singapore, where she was, um, uh, uh, I think, renovating the store and she had some old fixtures and she reached out to me and she didn't want to throw them away. And um, very long story short, we ended up sort of taking these materials and upcycling them into donation boxes for the food bank, who became a partner of ours in Restore. So. Um, so it's, it's really great to be on here again, uh, working with Stephanie and her team. Um, but uh, yeah, this topic that, that, that we realized was when you are in travel retail or a retailer or an operator or a brand, and you need to, you come to the end of life um, and you need to close a store down or you're renovating, there really is no outlet for your fixtures or your furniture. Um, you either put them in a warehouse or it goes to landfill. Um, and going to landfill is a, is a massive contributor um, of greenhouse gases, um, not just in, in travel retail, but in the construction se sector uh, as a whole. And then what we realized as we looked around was that this same problem applies right, right across many sectors. Um, so whether that's luxury brands, whether it's the hotels, whether it's F&B and cafes, um, and particularly during a period where, where COVID, there was a lot of consolidation, where people were merging or, or, or even closing, um, the it sort of exasperated, exaggerated the, the problem. Um, and so I just wanted to share um, three case studies because I really want to encourage people to think about um, not just looking forward for the next 10, 20, 30 years and thinking about going circular, um, but also being responsible for our last 10 years or 20 years um, 
and taking care of uh, what was our linear model. Um, uh, because, you know, if there's, there's probably airports, operators, retailers and brands listening to the stream or will watch it that have, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of stores and fixtures um, that will be changing and they don't know what to do with. So I think it's a really sort of big topic and I wanted to just kind of focus on that for a few minutes. Um, so one of the customers that came to us was a, was a luxury brand here in Singapore. Um, they were relocating their store and um, they asked us if we would be able to recover their assets. You know, these are really high end, high luxury items. I mean, you, none of us could imagine these going to landfill. So, you know, we, we didn't know what we were gonna do with them. We collected them, we brought them back to our warehouse. Um, we sort of touched items up. Um, you can see there in the bottom right, we're, we're starting to use some of the items as generic showcases or at uh, launches. Um, and we plan on using some of the more generic items in um, sort of short-term events and kind of pop-up spaces. Um, there's some collectibles in here and there's also some really ad hoc um, items that will be quite difficult to, to repurpose. And these are, you know, these are some of the challenges of, um, of what brands and retailers are faced with when they, when they close down a store. Uh, we also um, were appointed by uh, one of the major hotel chains here in Singapore. Um, after about 10 or 12 years, they were doing a uh, renovation right across the hotel. Um, and what do you do with a thousand beds and a thousand chairs and a thousand lamps um, and a thousand TV cabinets when you want to renovate your hotel? You know, there's just no outlet. And I'm sure this is the same in different parts of the world. Um, so again, we went in there through a phased approach. We, we worked with the hotel, we collected the items, we brought them back to our warehouse. Um, obviously what we wanna do is recover some cost uh, of obviously picking these up and, and, and warehousing them. So we did that through sort of fire sales to the hotel staff and our own staff. Uh, we even launched our own e-commerce site to try to promote some of these items through our um, direct networks. Um, and that sort of accounted for maybe 20 or 30% of the items, but there was still a, a lot of items that were, that were sitting there. And this um, coincided, and, and many of you may not sort of realize this, but, um, but in December last year, Malaysia had one of the worst floods in uh, many decades. Uh, so December and January, there was 125,000 people that were deplaced, um, had no homes. Um, and then again in February, uh, there was another another flood um, that put 12,000 people out of their you know their home, and so um, there was uh, there was a lot of the organisations, uh, relief organisations that were looking after and overseeing this. Um, we got in contact with them, and the thing they really needed the most was fridges uh, and mattresses. So um, it was fantastic for us to, one, clear our warehouse, but to be able to support such a crisis. And it's, I don't know if ironic is the word, but here we are talking about sustainability and circularity. Well, um, you know, to, to save our, our planet and, you know, the impact of climate change is so huge and massive. Uh, and, and here we are supporting an incident that was, that was caused by climate change. Um, so um, again, you know, if, if there are people around the world that are prepared to do this, there, there can be really good homes for, for these items that may otherwise have, um, have not been used. And, and lastly is um, uh, an example of a, a cafe on the left. Um, they were closing their cafe down and moving to a new location. The furniture was a bit old. They reached out and said, we wanna donate it to Restore. Um, so we collected again, brought it back to the warehouse, put it into our, our marketplace. Um, and within two months, we were um, uh, pleased to find a new home for these for these furniture in uh, a highly sustainable cafe called the Pallet Cafe. Um, and so I guess I just wanted to use this opportunity and, and this platform to encourage people to find partners in different markets around the world. Um, and while you're working on your future and uh, and all the circular sort of um, initiatives that you're taking on, please also consider um, your past and think about what we can do with uh, all of these assets we're going to have at the end of life. I think there's going to be a lot of people like us around the world that are doing great things that can support you uh, with taking those assets off your hands and, and making sure they go to good use. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, I was I was 
busy making a lot of notes uh, when, when you were talking there and uh, there's there's some really interesting points that both you and Stephanie have, have pulled uh, pulled upon um, you know one of them was you know with your partners obviously looking I guess locally because you know that, that again decreases the carbon footprint uh, as well um, but it strikes me that all these processes they might be a very simple statement to make but they're not straightforward you know, it requires a lot of lateral thinking, a lot of thinking out of the box and a lot of, you know, drawing lots of different elements together. And it's an incredibly technical process at times, uh, let's be honest. And I think that's what the obstacles um, sometimes are. For, I guess when you're having conversations with perhaps new uh, customers and they people don't realise uh, what goes on uh, behind making things, uh, you know, reducing carbon footprint and making things greener, that all the processes, um, you know, I just wanted to hear some of the obstacles that you facing conversations with you know encouraging people to become more more circular oh look absolutely charlotte i mean you know it's often cheaper and quicker just to make something new and throw things away i mean that's that's the reality um that's how the ecosystem and the infrastructure is set up at the moment mm -hmm. and it's going to take uh you know a fair amount of time with businesses that you will see on the panel today and many others around the world that are trying to trying to change the status quo um you know, we were fortunate enough, we have, you know, here in Singapore, the government has, you know, got a very, very big um, uh, green plan, 2030 green plan, and, and, and are really incentivizing businesses. So that really does help. Um, and you obviously need um, people that are pursuing um, in their own businesses, um, the topic of, of sustainability and trying to do the right thing. So, um, you know, it's still very much early days. Um, but we were really, really pleased that um, the, you know these really responsible customers have reached out. Um, it could have been they could have made life much easier for themselves and just ask someone to come and pick them up and throw them away, but they didn't. Um, we went through a process. We have to sign contracts. Uh, when you take possession of furniture, there's a lot of um, legal considerations. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of a lot of barriers that we've got to try to break down um, uh, in order to to move forward. Absolutely. Um, I know that uh, Graham has been fairly quiet up to this point, but uh, that's out of character for him. Uh, and I want to bring him into the conversation. We, we've had a couple of conversations over a, a few years now. Uh, and, and again, you've you faced some some challenges when you are trying to engage with uh, you know various companies. And again, I just wanted to bring you into the conversation. One, to sort of explain a little bit more about what uh, EnviroPoint does. Uh, and also, again, some of those obstacles that you face in conversations with uh, with potential partners. Of course. Um, so with EnviroPoint, I mentioned we now work with Polymateria. So some people may have recognized me from previous uh, publication press releases or last year's sustainability expo where I was discussing OXO biodegradable. We decided to pivot away from OXO biodegradable because it remained contentious in the EU rather than the rest of the world. And it was on the back of COP26. There was a company called Polymateria that was a new UK startup tech firm that created their own master batch that is the only one in the world that passes the BSI testing standards for the biodegradation of plastics. So rather than a degradation, I'm probably wrong in saying that Tim, they, they class it more as a biotransformation because the process of that plastic changes to a wax-like substance that then allows different microorganisms or the ecosystem itself through weather, um, sunlight to actually eat. I suppose for, for want of a simpler word, um, the, the remaining wax so that it leaves zero microplastics and no ecotoxins in the environment. Um, and that pivot away from something that wasn't working is something that we come up against with a number of companies. There's a reluctance to change their mindset. Um, so for example, we, we've spoke to a number of cruise operators that, that will be on this platform, um, a number of airports, and people are working with, for example, paper bags. And there's, 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 there's a mindset of, we're using something sustainable. We, we've made a good change. It's better than plastic without actually researching the full solution. So a lot of people don't realize that a paper bag, it has 70 times more air pollutants, 50 times more water pollutants. It takes 91% more energy to recycle a paper bag than it does a plastic bag. Um, then you've got the issue of deforestation, reducing the carbon sink in the environment. 
whereas a, a standard plastic bag only needs to be used once to be carbon neutral. The issue with plastic is its degradation period. So this is where I, I find the circular economy to be quite admirable, but flawed in its circle approach, I suppose. I, I feel that the circle shape needs to change and there needs to be different offshoots, maybe a star. I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Um, where different solutions need to be brought into the circular economy to actually make that solution whole. If we rely solely on circular, humans got the planet into the mess that it's in with plastic waste, with its carbon emissions, its carbon footprint, and relying solely on humans to remove ourselves from that is expecting failure down the line. So we need to, to take in these solutions. And speaking to airports about introducing polymateria into a range of plastic solutions, be it pallet trap, be it liquid security bags, bin liners, shopping bags. Some airports are quite keen to accelerate those discussions now, but we have came up against, dare I say, an egotistical um, side of the airport because they, they've decided we want to be the first to find the most carbon neutral aviation fuel. Um, and rather than taking the easy sustainable wins now, they want the big pat on the back and the big press releases for finding that aviation fuel rather than actually dealing with solutions in front of them that can make a big change to the environment now. The other side is cost. Um, and apologies if this seems like a rant at some points, it, it's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, but when it comes to cost, we, we I'll, I'll not name names, but we, we recently did a, a tender for the supply of liquid security bags to an airport. And we lost out because of half a pence a unit to a standard recyclable plastic bag. That airport then also asked us for our sustainability policy um, a couple of weeks later, which uh, was a little bit of a stab in the back. Um, however, that half a pence per unit, I think we need to take a different approach to how we introduce sustainable solutions, certainly as a commercial aspect, because our industry has been hurting for the last two years. So I, I do understand the reluctance to additional costs where, where a business ourselves, we, we've had the same issues over the last two years. However, there's sometimes smart solutions to be able to introduce. And Charlotte, we, we did a, a press release. It must've been about two years or so ago now where we discussed the introduction of the liquid security bags. Obviously, it, it's a free of charge consumable. So any airport wanting to increase the cost on it is going to have reluctance. So we decided why not create a dedicated branded zone that you can collect your liquid security bags from. But in that zone, we've all seen the big Perspex charity donation boxes with foreign currency. Have one of those built into that zone and have emblazoned behind that, that a percentage, for example, 75% goes towards a charity. So you could have it as save the oceans, removing plastic from the oceans. 25% goes into the provision of providing a free of charge sustainable solution. So not everyone will donate, we know that, but when people do donate, they'll donate in higher denominations than what the actual bag costs. So 10 pence, 20 pence a pound. So if you consider, for example, a, a polymateria liquid bag is two pence per bag. So somebody puts in one pound, 75 pence has gone to save the oceans, 25 pence has covered 12 and a half liquid bags for other customers that haven't donated. So you're actually removing the initial cost of that plastic bag to the airport, whilst also improving the sustainability platform with such an easy win and solution. Um, so I, I think there needs to be a, a broader outlook on how we introduce these solutions. Um, is it suitable to play the, the video now just so it gives people a bit more of a, a background to the solution? I was going to ask you to do that, actually, because, uh, yes, it's, in, it's indeed quite a technical um, a process. It is it's quite scientific and it's probably yeah. best that it's on the screen rather than me just uh, well, rambling through. <laughs> Both approaches are great. <laughs>
Thank you for uh, uh, providing us with that video as well. Really interesting. And it sort of blows my mind that something that starts out as, as obviously man-made then ends up being able to be in biological consumption. I mean, I'm sure I've missed out 100,000 steps in between, but, you know, it's, it's again, it's very, it's very technical. And I can imagine that in some of these conversations you have um, with airports, it, you know, you, you, you've got to keep them engaged. And, and uh, it's those that perhaps like Geneva Airport, the, the ones that have, you know, an open mind, um, and also, you know, essentially as well, building new terminals, because let's face it, maybe, you know, tearing, not tearing down, but, you know, trying to uh, create sustainable solutions for a terminal that's been there for a long, long time is, I, I can understand it, much more difficult than building uh, from scratch. Um, I, I could see, uh, Chris, you, you were nodding along quite a, a, lot, a lot there during uh, what uh, Graham was saying. And indeed, uh, you know, as we uh, watch the video, um, do you have uh, something to, um, to sort of feedback to Graham? On, on his points uh, I just I, I, I understand uh, probably a little bit of the frustration um, of uh, you know if you have you know an innovation it, it it's just not easy to 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 break a cycle um, and uh, you know some uh, yeah I was just sort of for me I, I understand when you come to um, somewhere like an airport that um, that is operating in, in you know such a way and methodology with you know with 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 stakeholders being there for a long time often um, trying to trying to get change integrated can be can be uh, hard work so I was just sort of okay. probably uh, feeling a little bit of the um, and that's not a general rule of thumb I just you know and I know that Graham didn't mean that either but I just you know it is it is it does take time for for innovation to you know but eventually it wins and it, and it gets there. Um, so absolutely. And if you can even demonstrate the fact, as Graham did very nicely there, that actually it doesn't always uh, cost more. Uh, and it, it can, in fact, pay for itself as long as you're willing to listen to that uh, solution and break that cycle. Actually, uh, talking of innovation uh, and very technical um, aspects, I wanted to bring in Naomi at this point uh, and introduce uh, what is a very, very exciting uh, new concept and one that I guess uh, takes uh, it, Naomi is much well placed to, to talk about than I am. So, Naomi, if you could, uh, again, uh, sort of uh, bring into the conversation the, what Kitro does and, you know, what it can do potentially uh, for the travel retail industry. Yes, I'm um, happy to share some slides. I'm just looking here. Just make sure my slides are visible. Can you see slides now? Yes, we can, yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, so at Kytro, we are focusing on uh, food waste measurement and, and monitoring. And I actually worked quite a bit in kitchens and in, in the service industry and saw firsthand how much food is being wasted. Um, and this led us to, to look into the problem of food waste and to understand that actually one third of all the food that's produced globally ends up being thrown away. And Eight, this is generating 8% of the global greenhouse gases. So it's quite an enormous issue. And when we look actually in this industry, 13% of the food that's being wasted is occurring from the food and beverage industry. I have a lag on my computer. I just wanna make sure that there's, the connection is, is strong. You guys can hear me. We can, we can so hear okay. you perfectly. Uh, <laughs> okay, perfect. <laughs> perfect. Um, so we're a Swiss-based company and we've done over uh, 250 measurements in Switzerland where we've measured in the kitchen and the dishwashing areas of, of hotel groups, of canteens, of universities. And what we saw is in the food and service industry, 20% of the food that is actually purchased is being thrown away. And the average cost of one kilo of food waste is seven euros. So you can imagine the daily average of food being wasted in one bin is 150 euros. And this adds up over time. So there's enormous cost that goes behind um, wasting unnecessary food. But even more important is actually the environmental impact. So this number varies depending on the food type, um, but the average uh, CO2 equivalent per kilo of food waste is 2.5 kilos. And 
I mean, having worked in industry, having having worked in kitchens, I saw how much of this edible food waste is, is completely unnecessary. We become blind to actually what we're throwing away because one person is producing the food, the next person is serving it, someone else comes and throws it away. We throw it away, we close the lid, and then it's ignored what is actually in that bin, how much value is in there, and what actions could have been taken to, um, to address the issue. So when we looked into uh, food waste in the industry, we saw that the solutions were quite um, manual. So a lot of the solutions that exist, we have audits where someone will come on site and they'll um, assess your food waste for two weeks and kind of get a snapshot and, and try to make uh, hypotheses based on this. Um, there are solutions where you're typing in what you're throwing away. And we said, okay, if we want people to take this step to, to really tackle food waste, we need to make it so easy in a kitchen that you can't really ignore the issue anymore. There's no additional step for the service member. The chef doesn't have to stand there and start to write things down or measure things because it's an industry where we already have a very high turnover. They're already overworked and underpaid. And so to ask them to do an additional step is just unrealistic. And so what we did is we looked at what technologies exist um, in other industries that could be applied to the aspect of food waste measurement. And so our solution is comprised of, of three different components. And so the first one is a device that actually goes into your kitchen and dishwashing area. And this device acts as a data capturing. So it's comprised of a scale and a camera. And I'll show you in a video kind of what that looks like in the, in the live environment. But basically, every time you're throwing something away, the weight shift is automatically triggering an image to be captured, as well as other metadata. Then we use image processing and machine learning. So we're looking at each image and identifying what food item we see on the image. And then based on all this information that we've collected with our device, we then give an analytics dashboard to the customer where they can see how much are they throwing away? What are the trends in their data points? Um, reverting back to what Stephanie said, uh, you need to set targets. We have to set targets and goals and really track how are we moving towards those goals? And that's what we do with this dashboard is really say, okay, um, what are the goals for your food waste and how are we going to achieve those goals? What specific items are we going to approach? Um, and what are the action points that we're going to take in order to, to achieve those reductions that we're looking for? So if you could play the first video. Um, in this video, you're going to see basically in, in one of our customers, they have uh, the, the screen trash bin and it's sitting on top of the, the platform, which is a scale. And every time something is thrown into the trash bin, uh, the weight shift triggers an image to be captured. So above the scale, there's a there's an, a camera. Um, can't see if the image is playing. Um, but basically we're capturing one image after the other, as well as the weight and the time of each food item. So here you can see uh, it does a time lapse. And based on this, we then feed it into an algorithm that can say uh, what was uh, captured in the image, how much, what time did it occur? And based on this, we start to look for patterns. So we can tell you, are you over portioning um, certain food items on your plate? Are the consumers not uh, perceiving a dish very well? Is your kitchen staff always overproducing a certain item? Um, are the buffets being filled too much at certain times? So we're really looking for trends and patterns in the data that we can then um, make, take actions and, and reduce the, the edible food waste by. Can I go back to the side? So, um, so um, looking at some of the case studies that we've done um, in the first 12 months, our average food waste reduction is 32 um, kilos. And as I said, we work with all different types of property. So it really depends on the type of property, whether it's a canteen or a hotel. Um, we also work with uh, um, academic canteens and event spaces. So depending on the food volume, um, as well as the food cost, we have different uh, reductions. But our goal with this is really, we have reductions as high as 60% in the first two years. And this is really the goal that we look to achieve is a 60% reduction of your edible food waste and 8% increase in your food profit margin. I would then just close with um, it's the last video that I have. Um, it's a it's in French, so I apologize, but there's a English subtitles. Um, it's a customer in um, a, a hospitality school that is measuring their food waste right now and their experience with the dashboard so far. Actuel, on a une une moyenne de gaspillage de 40 kilos par jour nourriture, et on aimerait vraiment descendre et réduire dans un avenir proche par 30%. Nous avons installé la, la station Kitro dans une station de débarrassage. C'est très simple d'utilisation. Les élèves débarrassent leurs assiettes 
La machine, elle prend la photo toute seule. Elle est... Moi, j'ai accès à ces données automatiquement depuis mon ordinateur sur la plateforme de Kitro. On voit l'impact des mesures grâce au tableau de bord et comme ça, on aura une meilleure euh, évaluation des économies euh, effectuées. Thank you, thank you very much, Naomi. That uh, yeah, really help, helps explain uh, how the tool works um, and just how much appetite has there been? Appetite being uh, no, no pun intended. Um, how, how's the appetite been for this sort of uh, device being implemented in, into kitchens and, and things uh, again uh, since the pandemic started? Has it in, increased? Yes, yeah, so we had a, a sore period when we had the, the lockdown and all of um, essentially our customers um, were, were closed down. Now, as, as we see um, the industry coming back to life, there is definitely this mindset that there is a need to invest in sustainable a sustainable future. Um, I think we still face the challenges, similar challenges to what Graham was saying before, um, that people say, okay, well, uh, we have paper bags, so it's okay, we're not using plastic, where people say, okay, um, we're composting, so it's not really food waste in the end, then is it right, because we're just composting, but that's, again, it's not a more, it's a more sustainable than burning it, but it's really not the, the, the goal that we need to be achieving. The, the goal we need to achieve is the food should never have been wasted in the first place. And how do we optimize to make sure that the resources that we have available are being valued and used in the right way? And I think the a challenge, again, another challenge that Graham was talking about is kind of this, the perception of, of ROI and, and what does it mean to have a positive return on investment when you, when you invest in something sustainable. And one of the challenges that we see is that oftentimes, um, the expectation is that it's a positive and a negative on the same kind of line or in the same area of the of the balance sheet. And in reality, when you invest in sustainability, you have a lot more positives that come from um, a new revenue stream opening up or a resource optimization in your fridges or in uh, your purchasing uh, performance increases from the staff because customer satisfaction or staff increases. So we have to kind of move away from thinking that if I buy this, then I have to have an immediate saving here, but rather look at all of the areas that you save and all of the increases in performance and, and other resource efficiencies that are a result of implementing a solution. Mm, looking at it more holistically um, rather than, uh, as you say, sort of a, a profit, um, increasing the profit um, scenario. I mean, we had uh, in our keynote um, session, we had Tessa Clark from Olio uh, talking about how, you know, um, people don't realise the, the carbon emissions that come from food waste um, and, and the fact that our industry particularly does get um, uh, perhaps uh, f too focused on sometimes on the, on the plastic problem. And I think she said that one kilogram of food waste is the same CO2 emissions as 25,500 milliliter plastic bottles, um, which is which is ex obviously extraordinary and uh, hideous at the same time. Um, but yes, it's it's sort of uh, education is obviously a vital part of that. Uh, and as I said, again, looking at the picture more holistically, I was actually going to um, uh, pass over to Stephanie at this point and see uh, if you might react um, to Naomi's uh, presentation and, and the idea and see if it's possible to introduce this sort of thing uh, to the travel retail industry and, and, and if you think it, it would it would it would work. Yes, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, thank you, Naomi. It was very inspiring. So I'm not going to answer directly to your question, Charlotte. Um, I, I would more uh, react on the circularity aspect and on, on what you, you just mentioned also uh, uh, in terms of comparison between um, one kilo of uh, food wasted and uh, and the plastic, uh, it it makes me uh, it it reminds me about uh, the difficulties that we had during our project in Geneva, when when we decide to focus on one uh, topic. I said it was very important to choose one battle. It is important indeed, but it is also very frustrating. And you were mentioning the plastic and the food waste and making parallels. Uh, what what I can share with you is that. At the beginning of our project, we were very convinced that, okay, carbon footprint was really the goal. We had to, to do really something about that. And very quickly during our project, and I'm sure that Chris uh, can react also about this, we were very frustrated by the fact that we were not able to make ourselves our, our choices because you were considering on one hand only the carbon footprint and on the other hand, you had so many other topics to put in the balance and you were, you were getting lost, you know? So, 
I don't know if it uh, if it uh, if if you, Chris, you can uh, also uh, react on that. But uh, I mean, it's 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 a, it's a long way. I mean, CSR is just so vast. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's important to choose your battle and sometimes also to also uh, rethink if your battle is the right one or if you cannot uh, make uh, you know another. Uh, uh, a twin uh, a twin battle in parallel in order to uh, to be more efficient uh, on your way to uh, sustainability. Mm -hmm. Chris, did you want to come in on that? I can see you uh, violently nodding your head. <laughs> well, not violently, but yeah, <laughs> um, yes. Uh, you know, I think St Stephanie's uh, exactly right. Um, you have um, a vision for what you'd like to do, and you find alternative materials. Um, but the reality in a lot of airports around the world is we have very tight regulations for fire, fire ratings, fire retardants, um, and those regulations change. Um, so they're not consistent. Um, you know, you can look at Frankfurt Airport and Munich Airport and the regulations around fire are, are different. Um, so, you know, if you are trying to roll out a global toolkit, for example, like um, Stephanie might want to do, uh, it's quite hard. You you have to sort of work to the lowest common denominator in a lot of uh, a lot of these situations um, in order to to deal with the the, the current reality. Um, there's things like uh, obviously cost is is massively important when you're you're spending a lot of money on on building stores. Um, while the growth of suppliers and the number of materials and alternative material suppliers are growing, um, they're still in the early stages. So asking them to compete on price with plywood or MDF um, with the distribution models they've got is, is almost impossible. Um, so you have things like that, you know, do the, do the local suppliers hold stock? Um, no, you know, you have to have minimum quantity orders and things like that. So, you know, there, there are all sorts of um, issues, um, you know, materials, particularly these alternative materials, uh, bio-waste materials, they, they have different uh, characteristics. So paint, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't react the same way uh, to some of these materials. You know, when you cut it, it's not a clean cut. Um, so there's all these types of things that you have to work through. Um, so yeah, trying to, trying to bring the reality of regulation and commercials together with the aspirations to, you know, to 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 be more sustainable is 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 really a balance. Mm. We we had this conversation. Uh, I think it was I think it was yesterday. All these days roll into one. But um, uh, Marie from from Loxitan was talking about how uh, the research and development team there were looking at um, recycling plastics back to their monomer form and what that look like for high-end skincare now she said it, it's not pretty it's not transparent it looks kind of grayish and and you know it has to look palatable um for you know especially consumer of high-end or luxury goods and then we had a conversation around education and perhaps educating consumers to you know luxury you know does some of the impacts that uh, those luxury processes cost to the earth um so it's 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 a it's a two-part process it is about um you know trailblazing and pushing um but you know thinking outside the box and you know companies such as L'Occitane or L'Oreal or Lord or whoever is in the beauty sector you know making those investments and making those discoveries I think I'm picking, picking up on on uh, Stephanie's word earlier you know to to make it easier for others to follow suit um make it as I said you know making those discoveries every day so that the rest of the industry can benefit um uh, Michael I actually just wanted to pass over to you because I'm I, I'm cognizant that there might be uh, lots of other questions coming in from the audience and it's not just mine that should be answered no, sure. Thank, thanks, Charlotte. But I just wanted to actually throw your question to Stephanie back to Naomi um, about you know, the, the interest to, uh, from, from our industry. I'm pretty sure it was you, Naomi, who said that you were all, already working with HMS Host in one market. Is that right? Um, a big F&B operator in not just airport industry, but travel in general. Um, was it you or was it perhaps uh, Olio? Or, I can't remember. I think that must be in Alia. We are. We uh, have done some trials with the um, canteen or uh, F and B operators for the airline industry, though. You have okay. And, and what was the interest been for from the airline and the travel industry in general? There's a lot of. I think it's it's two sided. There's one from the consumer, so there's consumers driving the the demand, and then them themselves looking for cost optimization or more um, to offset the the carbon the carbon footprint for sure. Uh, it is definitely a challenging industry to um, to work in because there are so many different aspects and its operation 
traditionally quite complex um, when we think of these operators that are uh, producing food menus for uh, hundreds of planes and different airlines every day. Um, so it's definitely more complicated, but it, there's a huge opportunity to reduce waste as well because the waste amount is, is enormous in the industry actually. It's interesting you mentioned the consumer because there's a question came in anonymously again, but um, do Kitro's clients communicate to their consumers about the food waste management program? And if so, what feedback do they have? Yes, um, so we work with a lot of university uh, canteens and there it's quite easy to do one-to-one -one communication to the end consumer. In luxury hotels, it's a bit more delicate. And I think this is where um, we really need to, to see that in order to achieve a circular economy and to achieve waste reduction at the high levels, we do need a shift in mindset of, of every individual. So it doesn't matter how many actions we take, um, but because already now hotels and restaurants, canteens, they're, they're working towards mitigating food waste, but there is some reluctancy or fear that they're going to disappoint the guests if they make smaller portion size, if they remove um, shrimp from their buffet, if they have less meat options. And so it's also not just on the industry, whether it's retail or food and service, but really about every individual saying, OK, um, I'm going to start demanding that or start asking proactively asking um, what is being done when it comes to food waste and proactively thinking what actions am I taking or what are my expectations that are contributing to food waste and start to think twice about how you are actually driving food waste in itself and it's not just always the big corporates or the big companies that need to be blamed for um, for the production of, of, of waste. And while we're still on you Nemi uh, another question was about your I guess the geographical footprint and in which markets do you see Kitro developing faster uh, and why? So right now we are primarily in Switzerland. Uh, we have trials in Germany. We just actually started trials in Greece as well because more and more countries in the EU are mandating um, food waste reporting. The challenge we have is that food waste has not fully, how we report it, how we track it has not really been defined on a country level in many countries. And so the first step is just to say, okay, report something. And the hope is that we can say, okay, well, now that we've reported, now we have goals. So here are the goals. And in 2030, if we want to say we have food waste with the SDG goal from the UN, how are we going to say that we have food waste and we haven't even quantified the problem? So we see that really these countries that are, are setting the regulations, we see faster movers. Um, Greece, for instance, we have a, a lot of interest now from that market. Um, Europe in general is, is quite strongly uh, moving in, in the direction of, of food waste reporting. Um, with that said, we also know that Australia just um, last year or during COVID, they had a, a mandate for food waste uh, mitigation and they had a government support going towards a finding solution. So Singapore as well has a food waste mitigation um, initiatives in place. And in, in these countries where we really see that it's coming from the country that they're setting um, regulations and, and saying you have to measure now, this is where we're having the biggest um, demand from, from uh, consumers. Right, thanks for that. Uh, Charlotte, if I continue, because we have some other questions coming from, from the uh, viewers. But um, on the, the sort of the global footprint and impact and so on, there's some, uh, you mentioned Tessa Clark, who was speaking in the keynote session earlier, Charlotte. Um, Olio uh, on their website, which is olioex.com, have some really interesting videos. You click on their videos tab about the just general food waste problem and some interesting and amusing videos. So it's worth checking that out for people who are interested. Um, so coming back to the Q&A from the audience, uh, I'll go to one who actually has signed his question, um, uh, Alex, Alexander Ada, uh, who is from Garçon Wines, and um, I hope I get this right, um, sorry Alex, what is it, Pacamama, hope I got the name right, Pacamama, interesting name, and he asks, how can we ensure recyclable products get recycled in the travel retail industry. I'm going to throw this to you, Stephanie, first. We're looking, he says, we're looking to supply a 100% recyclable and recycled product for airlines and duty-free. By that, he's referring to the Gas on Wines flat bottle, which uh, one of our speakers actually tomorrow in the spirit session is using um, Accolade wines. Um, so Gas on Wines produce that for their own wines, but they're also now supplying it to different companies. So he says, we're looking to buy 100% recyclable and recycled product for airlines and duty free, but how can we ensure they will be collected for recycling and recycled? So it's all about the infrastructure. Um, and that's obviously a big challenge as well. Um, Stephanie, do you want to take that? Yes, I can. Um, I can mention what we found in the guidelines of a recent tender to which we participated. 
uh, it was requested to the um, to the operator to the to the operators applying to the standard to already uh, think uh, when designing the store when des making their renderings to apply to the tender to already think about where they would put um, uh, uh, location for uh, collecting you know uh, all uh, uh, the packagings. Uh, of course, when you speak about uh, uh, a bottle of uh, alcohol, it's a little bit complicated because you are maybe not uh, uh, intending to to, uh, to drink immediately your, your bottle of wine once you have uh, bought it. But it's showing that things are uh, moving on. So airports are asking us to uh, to implement that in our stores. And second, uh, second thing, which I can answer, it was mentioned earlier, it's all about education. I think we, we can play a role as operator and as airports already do, most of them are already doing. It is also about communicating in our stores about the good, good ways to uh, handle what has been bought in our stores, meaning that just uh, um, re, uh, re, uh, uh, reinforcing these messages which are obvious, but okay, you are buying this, make sure that once you have uh, consumed this uh, bottle or these perfumes or whatever, you will, uh, you will uh, put your disposables in the, right, uh, in the right place. I think this is already, it can sound a little bit, hein? it's, it's a, a small piece of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, all what we have to do, but it's uh, what we can do, I think, in our stores already. And we can uh, reinforce this uh, kind of messages uh, through uh, through uh, a collaboration with uh, our landlords. I mean, the messages can really reinforce if you collaborate with your landlord, and that you make sure that the message are uh, before the store, inside the store, outside of the store, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm, I think from from memory, you know, the airports traveled through recently. We're not doing too bad as an industry when it comes to. Um, uh, communication to passengers about where they can dispose of, you know, for example, um, plastic bottles and coffee cups and so on. Compared to downtown here in, in Sydney, in the, in the suburb of Sydney I live in, everybody now is using biodegradable uh, cups and um, uh, compostable lids on their coffee. And as you know, Australia is a big coffee culture country. Is there a single um, bin in sight? To, to dispose of those um, biodegradable cups? No, it's all going into the general waste. So um, it's it's a bit, yeah, it, it's a dilemma, but thankfully we as an industry seem to be a little bit um, uh, more up to speed on that. Uh, again, it's an infrastructure and a mindset uh, question, but Graham, you had your hand up and I think I know what you're gonna say. You yeah. shared something on LinkedIn, <laughs> which is really yeah, good. I'll talk about that. Yeah, so I shared this with Michael the other day on LinkedIn and such a simple thing, obviously, humans react very much to language and imageries. Um, and one of the simple changes that can be made is to the standard rubbish bin, changing the wording. And it was so simple that they, they had two bins next to each other. And it was one that said, I think it was litter or rubbish. And the second bin said landfill. A lot less goes in the landfill bin because people are then more conscious about what they do with their end product and just changing that language and the imagery has a huge effect. And I think that's such a simple movement for all different industries to, to be able to introduce. Yeah, I mean, because you're working with airports yourself on, on the various products and services that you provide, what, what's your take on the willingness of uh, airports to, to engage and understand and, and progress in, in this, in the infrastructure for recycling? It depends on departments, to be honest, because there's so many layers of management in airports that you can speak to one department and they're incredibly keen on introducing the technology that you tell them about, but they then go to their boss and their boss is more directed towards a different approach or is more focused on something else. So the, the acceleration that you noticed in speaking to that department slows down considerably. Um, so there is interest, but because of the multi-layer management of aviation, it, it sometimes makes that a little bit more difficult to introduce immediately. It's, it's sometimes more of a slow burner, but there's definitely interest in departments. It's just trying to get that through to the end process. 
So, so for a company looking to provide a sustainable service to, like you do, to uh, an airport or an airport retailer um, environment or, or airline or cruise for that matter, what's your advice to companies watching? Is it to go to the sustainable um, sustainability manager or to the commercial department? Um, in truth, the, the place where I've noticed most success was the retail team and the commercial team. Um, there is interest from the sustainability team, but they then have to go to the commercial team or procurement. Um, so it sounds terrible, but sometimes bypassing that department actually achieves the result sooner, which is ludicrous when you consider that is the role that they're there for. They, they sh should be given that little bit more autonomy to be, be able to make those decisions. And thankfully, I, I did speak to one yesterday on the platform that I, that I contacted and mentioned the solution about uh, the dedicated pickup point for um, the liquid security bags. And she was over the moon and said, I'm sure my finance department will love this because it's removing the cost altogether. Um, so that there are circumstances where, where it is, but because from one airport to the next is, uh, I think it was Chris suggesting before, the process is different, even down to the materials that they use, that if you take one singular approach to all airports, then you're not going to get the same result in your rollout. You, you need to essentially target it in a multifaceted way to be able to achieve the success. Mm. And uh, moving on, Graham, sorry, well, you're, you've got the mic, um, so to speak. The, there's a question on your polymateria material um, uh, that comes in again anonymously, but it says, are solutions such as polymateria appropriate for STEBs? I presume this is coming from a liquor company. And have you already engaged with the travel TR trade associations, travel retail trade associations, or even ICAO? Yes, so we, we actually um, have tried to contact ICAO um, with no success in responses back, to be honest, because it, it is ideal for introducing into the step bags. Um, we, we know they're a requirement, they use the plastic, and because of the nature of international travel, so many passengers will be going to a destination that they then won't recycle, which means it ends in landfill. So having a solution like this that can be implemented is ideal for, for those bags, but unfortunately, um, if anyone from IKEA was listening, um, please contact me. Well, we'll try and get, I'm sure I know ETRC <laughs> and the team there are obviously regularly in contact with them. So uh, we'll try and push it that way. Um, <laughs> that, thanks, Ray. Moving on, we've got um, a number of other questions that have come in. Um, let me just go to, I think, a few for Stephanie uh, at the beginning. Um, Stephanie, for the eco design store, is it better to focus more on recycled? or recyclable elements for the store build and furniture to reduce the carbon footprint. And Chris, you can take that as well afterwards if you want. So Steph. Well, uh, I think everything is about circularity. So you have your answer. It's uh, definitely better uh, to uh, reuse existing materials rather than to, uh, to pick uh, some uh, new ones, virgin ones. But uh, it was mentioned uh, earlier, you have to break the system. Huh? It's definitely about that. So. Uh, and, uh, and there is also, uh, it was also mentioned earlier by, uh, by, by Chris when you uh, mentioned your uh, project with uh, I and uh, luxury brand. This is also something we are thinking about at the moment because if you think about circularity, it's not only circularity about your duty free stores, your uh, multi brand stores, the ones, the ones for which we are uh, totally uh, designing everything. It's also uh, the stores from the brands which we operate, which we build. And then uh, you have to open discussions with these brands because there's some, sometimes in huge airports, not to mention Paris airport, for example, we have uh, cycles which are quite uh, small, meaning that one store can be open for three years and then uh, completely closed, stripped out, and we rebuild uh, the same uh, luxury brand uh, just uh, two or three meters uh, after where, where it was. And then here we have the opportunity to open also discussions with brands about why, why not uh, reusing the, the existing uh, lighting fixtures, reusing a part of the furniture, reusing um, a part of the uh, technical equipments, etc. So, okay, Chris, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I just kind of come back to the point of regenerative design. 
um, ultimately what you want to be able to do is design something in a way um, that at the end of life you have a plan for what you can do and you can reuse it uh, over and over and over again. I mean, that's the best uh, possible solution. Um, recycling has obviously been around, around for a long time. And I sort of come back to the previous point that the person asked about um, recycled packaging. Um, and kind of one of the points that I would make about recycle, recycling and recycled packaging is um, there is a big onus on the packaging designer. Um, you know, if you want to use single use plastics, um, then, you know, obviously you're going to have to think about, um, you know, how you, how you can recycle that plastic. Um, but if you want to use an alternative material, an aluminium or a steel container for your shampoo, um, I know a, a colleague of mine, a good friend of mine here launched the powder shampoo in Singapore. Uh, she wanted to take water out of the, the, the shampoo and she wanted to remove single use plastic. So she's made an aluminium uh, package. Uh, that's made of powder, you buy the, the shampoo and then you get refills out of sustainable packaging, you know. So um, there are ways to avoid having to recycle if you, you know, again, come back to this regenerative design process. So I think that's that's probably one of the keys for me. Okay. And and while you've got the mic again, um, question <clears throat> uh, directed at you was, uh, and about Asia Pacific as well. Uh, since COVID, some businesses have become more inward focused to, to survive, uh, the person said. How has that impacted their desire to be more eco-conscious in the retail design? Is it more for the good times only, or has it become ingrained into corporate DNA in Asia Pacific? Hmm, good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think what COVID has done is it, on the one hand, people have become more aware of the importance um, of sus being sustainable and reducing a carbon footprint and the effect on climate change, for sure. Um, however, there's been a lot of industry um, that has been badly affected during COVID, um, who are obviously trying to get on with, with business as usual. Um, Countries like Singapore, the governments are really, uh, you know, really incentivizing it. So it can make commercial sense as well as ethical sense to get on and, and do something about that. Um, however, we, you know, we still have an infrastructure that is largely, you know, Asia, China, biggest market in the world, 1.4 billion people, Southeast Asia, 650 odd million people. Um, there's a lot of people that need things um, and need things quickly and at a price point. And so, you know, that the, 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 the process is going to be a, a long one. I don't know if I'm asking the quest, answering the question because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a good question, but um, my experience uh, certainly in travel retailers is that there's a big appetite for, um, you know, for, for becoming more sustainable. Um, but I also understand in other industries that um, it might take a longer time until some of these barriers are broken down that we talked about earlier. Okay. Um, now, I don't know if this was addressed to you or to Steph, but you can both answer it. Um, uh, another question was, how do you communicate the sustainability of the store to the traveling consumer? I presume it's referring to the eco store in Geneva, but you know, it, it could also be you know, for any stores that you're designing and, and uh, with partners in, in travel retail or domestic, Chris. So you want to start on that and then ask Steph afterwards. Well, yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry, Chris. You go, Steph. You go, you go. Okay, well, we had long discussions internally about whether we should communicate on, uh, upon what we did on the store or not. So actually in Geneva, as it was a POC for us, we decided to communicate. If, if I have to, let's say, take uh, or share the um, uh, output of this project, let's, let's, call, it, let's all, call it like this. I, I'm not sure that this is really uh, what is interesting our customers and I'm not sure that it, it's really worth. Even though some studies are showing that uh, our customers uh, are getting more and more, uh, uh, passengers are really getting more and more uh, sensible to what is communicated on, on, the, on the point of sales, definitely. And, uh, and also about what is done in terms of uh, architecture and, uh, and construction. However, I, I'm not really sure that this is relevant. Uh, if you consider our small stores in, uh, in, uh, in Geneva, it's 100 square meter. We decided to put a panel on the right of the entrance with uh, all what we had done about uh, the, the carbon footprint of the furniture. And also we had some messages about the, the selection of uh, the, the sustainable offer. I mean, 
your passenger is first there to, to do his shopping and, and, and looking for maybe, you know, some, I don't know, tobacco or anything else. I'm not really sure it's relevant. I'm not really, really sure. So it's, it's quite frustrating because you can do many, many things. And uh, maybe in the end, you are not going to communicate about that. But as, we, as it was said also earlier during this session, it's also about humility. Huh? I mean, do the things. And uh, it's maybe not always necessary to communicate about what you're doing. I, I don't know about the consumer, but what, what about the customer then, um, in terms of the trade customer? Are you seeing since the announcement about the Geneva store and working with other airports, that there's an increase in demand and sort of more people knocking at your door to say, hey, can we have some of that as well? I'm not sure to get your point, sorry. For for the trade customers, so your airport partners yeah. or other in travel in, in travel environments, um, do you because you've launched this? It's just been announced recently. Has that generated a, a, a more interest from within the industry? Say, hey, this is really interesting. We'd like to do uh, something similar at our airport. Yeah, definitely, really? definitely. Yeah. But as I said, it was just a POC. It was a way for us to to get into sustainability with a, a concrete uh, project, and now the. Uh, the goal for us is uh, more to uh, totally uh, review our uh, major concept idea duty free from scratch because one of uh, of the output of this project was that it is actually very complicated to decarbonate an existing concept without eco-designing from the beginning. It was said earlier, the more you will eco-design from the beginning, the better you will, uh, you will manage the end of the life of the store. So it was a very good way for us to, to, to learn that by ourselves. But now really the idea is to, uh, to, uh, to get a, a new idea duty-free in incorporating this uh, CSR aspect. Right, thanks. And then just throwing that before we go back to you, Charlotte, throwing that question about the consumer communication to, to you, Chris, do you want to take that? Yeah, look, I think it's a great opportunity for retailers. I've seen retailers here in Singapore that um, that have really embraced what they've done and promoted it really, really well. Um, you see signs um, that talk about, you know, their packaging and what, you know, what their all their packaging is, you know, recycled this and um, all the timber you see in the store um, has been as FSC and it's been sustainably sourced. Um, and you can click these links to find out more. All power has been, you know, and I just think um, it adds to the feel good um, of of the store. Um, and it's a, it can be it can be a real benefit if it's if it's done right. Um, and I've seen a couple of examples done right here in Singapore, and I think uh, it would serve them, you know, very very well. So I think it is a good opportunity and. Um, and I think customers like being reminded that they're in, you know, that the people that they're doing business with um, are taking responsibility. That's definitely a debate that's going to continue, I think, because there, there's definitely been the, the, the two uh, sides of the story, two opinions that have been aired over the course of the sessions this week. We've definitely heard both sides of the story. And I think I can understand both sides as well. Um, but I'm sure those those conversations will continue um, uh, directly after this session. We have the next one and then we have a full day tomorrow as well. But uh, we'll, I'll, I'll draw this uh, session to a close. Uh, I'd love to continue talking to you guys all day because honestly, so inspiring and and. And it's it's actually very exciting uh, to be able to you know give all these you know all these ideas and all this information to the viewer uh, that they can either approach you guys directly or they can reach out for just more questions or information and hopefully we can, can connect the audience and and lots of other companies together in order to progress in our sustainable sustainability goals uh, as an industry. Um, now, as I uh, alluded to earlier, I'd like to come to each of you now and just sort of find out what next steps or even actions you might be able to take following this session um, after what you've heard. And uh, yeah, and obviously we'd love to hear back from you if you've been able to take those steps and actions and, and uh, cover it uh, online at trbusiness.com. So Graham, I'll come to you first, if that's okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for um, inviting me to the session again. Um, it's been quite inspiring. Um, in terms of our next steps, it's, it's really trying to introduce polymateria to as many single-use plastic products as possible. Um, so from bin liners to pallet wrap, so that, that works for the cargo as well as operators like myself with luggage point doing bag wrapping in the terminals, um, to the retail bags, to liquid security bags, and really trying to maximize the awareness that 
there is actually a sustainable low cost solution that can be introduced swiftly into the industry. Um, and because our industry is, is worldwide, it's something that we can easily accelerate into so many different territories. So for us, it's, it's more about trying to introduce that solution as, as far and wide as possible. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Graham. Uh, and now Chris. Yeah, um, thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, so first for us as, as people, um, so we're gonna continue to uh, train um, and educate and um, you know our designers go through um, all sorts of courses, regenerative design courses, circo courses, um, and we really encourage them to keep learning. Um, a number of our staff are lead accredited. Um, a number do circular economy management courses in their own time. So I think um, the big thing for us is we've got to keep pushing our um, certifications and compliances um, to, to be credible leaders in the space. Um, so that's, that's probably one. Um, the, the second thing is we are, are prototyping our e-commerce marketplace, and this is to support uh, all the recovery of assets that we um, that we have in our warehouses. Um, we need to be able to, you know, promote that to channels um, and uh, and and give them a second uh, second lease of life. So we've got plans to 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 really grow that. Um, we are also investing in our own uh, workshop. So. Um, one of the challenges we've found is that um, existing factories are not yet set up for repairs um, and and renovation type type work, uh, and also um, you know asking people to work with these alternative materials when they're trying to do volume uh, work has been quite difficult. So we're you know we're we're, we're working on a, a sort of a small um, uh, pilot sort of workshop uh, where we can pilot things, trial things before we. Um, promote them and recommend them. Um, so that's probably another another thing that we're really working on. And, and lastly, is our uh, innovation lab. So we, you know, throw ourselves into the industry, meet partners. Um, there's new innovations coming up everywhere um, around the world. So we're looking to partner with people, find um, alternative materials, um, processes, products um, that we can sort of bring in and and be able to share with our customers. So um, so that, that's that's probably the the things for the rest of the year that we'll be focused on. Great. Look forward to hearing more about uh, those projects coming up. Uh, definitely, we'll return to to you on that in the coming weeks. Uh, and Stephanie. Yes, thank you, Charlotte. So for us, um, first we have this uh, little uh, project in uh, in Singapore, which will be uh, managed by Chris and uh, my colleague Monica Kominaki. Uh, it's exactly the same uh, the same uh, approach that we had in Geneva. We have another uh, initiative at the moment, also starting in uh, in Prague Airport with our local team, same approach. They try to, to, de to decarbonate, uh, uh, not, not the idea duty-free concept, but uh, a, a local concept, really turn to, uh, to local offer. So we really support them. We share with them all the outputs of uh, our project in Geneva. And uh, the same for them. We exchange a lot of, uh, we have a back and forth uh, together. Second point is about really educating the teams so uh, we are uh, in the middle now of uh, the development of, uh, of a dedicated uh, training session to uh, a large team within uh, the group uh, Lagarda Travel Retail about eco-designing, uh, including not only the designers or the, 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 the concept teams, but also uh, the people from the uh, indirect purchases, very important to have uh, you know, a, a larger uh, team. Um, sensibilized on all these topics, and last but not least, this will help us to uh, to be stronger, to uh, to redesign, to redevelop our new uh, green idea duty free uh, concept. Fantastic, thank you, Stephanie. And uh, finally, Naomi. Um, yeah, for us, the next steps are definitely um, to increase the, the number of measurements that we're doing. Uh, we're starting to build benchmarks based on the data that we've collected. So for different industries um, to benchmark hotels um, and, and set averages for, for country or even um, specific segments. So um, really growth and, and expansion there. And with that, uh, it would be exciting to, to start measuring and, and reducing food waste more in, um, in airports and uh, in, in these sectors. So if there's anyone interested in um, focusing on food waste and, and tackling that issue, we'd be happy to help you there. Um, but they, I, it's also been inspiring to see uh, what different innovations there are and, and uh, Chris, how, how you think about uh, 
what resources we have and how can we reuse them and how can we before thinking of buying new or uh, building new how can we reuse that so I think a lot of our customers also ask us how can they be more sustainable and how can they um, what other actions can they take and so for us it's always very inspiring and, and great to collect this catalog for for customers to show them okay food waste is just one issue and yes you should definitely focus on one but there's so many different things that need to be addressed um, within a hotel within a canteen and uh, for me, it's been very inspiring to hear what else is being done. So thank you for that. Great to hear that you've uh, been learning along the process as well. And uh, as, as have I, and I'm sure Michael uh, as well has topped up his, his knowledge when it comes to uh, CSR. Uh, yeah, well, now we're going to bring this session to a close. I just want to say thank you to all our panellists. Uh, I know it's, 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 a long, it's a long time to spare in, in, in busy schedules. So really, really appreciate all your contributions today. Um, and please do keep in touch with any developments you have going forward. Uh, and uh, I'd like to pass over to Michael for some closing remarks. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm brief. Just would say thank you to all the speakers. It's been really interesting. It's such a vast subject, circularity, and uh, it's been really interesting to hear about it from different perspectives. Um, and going forward, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about how each of you um, will engage more with, with um, other partners and stakeholders in the industry, the development of polymateria, more designable uh, uh, eco design stores, um, and of course, more. Uh, food waste management uh, within travel retail as well and um, everybody watching you can contact our speakers um, if you don't have the contact details come to us and we'll, we'll provide them for you um, but the presentations um, with their permission will be also made available after the session as well this recording uh, as we mentioned earlier on it's going to be um, right here on the uh, travel retail sustainability week.com platform and also on the TR Business YouTube channel. So do go and check this out again uh, at, at your own, in your own time and let your colleagues know too. Um, so we'll see you again in about just less than an hour for the next session on the future of food. And of course, all through tomorrow. But just before we close, a final word about the events coming up. As Charlotte alluded to earlier on, we've got lots of coming up in the, in the coming months and weeks, starting in just three weeks time. Uh, in Singapore, we'll be there at the TFWA Asia Pacific event, curating a session on sustainable futures, looking at obviously at sustainability, but also the consumer and how businesses and industry are working to make the business more sustainable. It's not just about the environment, but also the future of the business. Um, and then in June, we have two webinars coming up on health and well-being once again on June the 15th. But before that, on June the 1st, we've got one again on diversity and inclusion. And if you caught yesterday's webinar on that, you know that it's going to be another interesting one uh, then on June the 1st. Uh, 5th to the 7th of September, we'll be announcing the venue very, very soon in Cyprus with our host sponsor, Cyprus Duty Free, um, part of Arianta. Uh, we'll be meeting there for two days. It's the second edition of the Travel Retail Consumer Forum. Um, so um, I'll be engaging with some of the speakers we've had here this week because I've learned lots and uh, sustainability is going to be one of the key sessions there as well. Um, so Chris, interesting to hear more about your workshops as well and see how we can maybe work that into the program. But um, there's lots going to be uh, happening there at that event uh, for two days, 5th to the 7th of September. And finally, right now, entries are underway for the um, 5th. 18, 19, 20, 5th edition of the uh, Travel Retail Awards, uh, which are the industry's only consumer voted awards. So across all categories, even airports and retailers, you can submit your entries for uh, per category or for the best sustainable uh, retail award or the best sustainable supplier award. Um, so all those initiatives do send them in. Um, it's uh, open on travelretailawards.com. Entries close end of May. Uh, and we'll be um, having the judging process with the consumers, uh, courtesy of our uh, partners on that uh, mindset uh, and the award ceremony will be in Cannes on Tuesday the 4th of October so looking forward to seeing you all there as well so that's that that's it from me thanks very much thanks again to you all and finally thanks to Mars, Beam Suntory, Diageo, JTI and L'Occitane Provence for supporting this session take care see you later bye-bye <laughs>